Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you in part by Grow Mark FS. Keeping up with the latest in ag is a challenge to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up to date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And good afternoon. Welcome into Market Talk for this Wednesday, October 6th. Great to have you here with us once again. Thanks for making us part of your day. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. MarketTalkAg.com. That's our home on the web where you can find us. MarketTalkAg.com. All of our social media links are there. Streaming sources everywhere. You can listen to podcasts worldwide. You can find Market Talk. And uh, those links, a lot of them are up on our website, MarketTalkAg.com. Got plenty to talk about in the trade today. Quarter beans under a little pressure. Wheat was higher. Uh, and we saw on the livestock side, another day of cattle higher and hogs on the low side. Let's talk about all of it. Let's bring in our good friend Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics joining us today. Mike, happy Wednesday. How are you, sir? Doing great. We had a mixed day today, so I call it good, Jesse. I will go with that as well. You know, I am I am in the camp of I'm not too discouraged with today's close. And, to, you know, to my I won't call it an untrained eye, but I'm not an expert by any means. That's why I talk to you. Um, I, I just feel like the sentiment in this market is even though we pulled lower on corn and soybeans today, is, is that there's just there's some good positive underlying uh, factors here in the market here. We've kind of fleshed out a lot of the stuff from last week with the USDA report. It just feels like now we're waiting on some more news. But overall, I, I'm not too discouraged with the way things close today. No, and I think that's a really good way to frame it because we did have a real serious pullback in the natural gas and that pulled the rest of the energy complex lower. So it made sense that uh, commodities like soybean oil and canola, those those vegetable oil markets would have a pullback with the energies. Incidentally, the natural gas market, we're going to have to really keep an eye on this because it was down 5 to 8% on uh, Wednesday's trade. The, the market was able to find a little bit more deep of a cut in profit taking by the longs when uh, Vladimir Putin from Russia said he was going to come in and help support the energy markets in terms of supplying more energy to Europe, which would include natural gas. This may happen, but I would also say it's worthy to keep an eye on it in case, you know, this is not something that actually happens and it's used as, I hate to say it, a political weapon, you know, to to move the geopolitics in a direction that he wants to move it since energy is one of his big things he has to be able to utilize in that mindset. So just an FYI that that was one of the big reasons why the, the natural gas pulled back so substantially. So I had just a little bit of an issue with that, but the, I think you made a very good point. The ethanol data was very strong. We had ethanol supplies drop. We had production go up. And that's even with unleaded gasoline stocks going up as well. And so very strong ethanol data. Egypt was in for about 240,000 tons of wheat. Yes, Russia and Ukraine got the business, but the Egyptians had to pay up about nine bucks a ton from when they came in about three weeks ago. And so the world wheat price continues to go up. And that was kind of the headline by the market after we saw the data of what Egypt actually purchased. And so we have that. We also had Ukraine come in. Their agriculture ministry said that they were going to cut their production back down to uh, 31.55 million tons on wheat. That compares to USDA September WASDI report of 33 million tons. That's a biggie because, you know, Ukraine's right there with Russia as our main competitor. So I think you had some supply demand fundamentals there that helped offset what the soybean oil was trying to do to the uh, soybeans. And I think most importantly, I noticed that the bean oil divided by the meal, that oil meal spread. Um, and if you want to flip that upside down, the, the meal oil spread um, and ratio got to the lowest level yesterday since 1998, Jesse. So we're in the gutter when it comes to meal being discounted to the bean oil. I find this very important from a standpoint of not just historically, but also from a standpoint that China may jump 
uh, buying beans until you know South America gets more and we get more and just go straight after the, the meal if these uh, power cuts continue in their northeast provinces so that their crushing facilities really can't operate. So I think the meal is a real wa uh, something to watch real closely here. And it had a good day today, which was an odd thing to see. Obviously, it was spread unwinding. Well, and, you know, we watched the China factor here, and obviously we've had a slow start to the export season and everything else, and we'll see what China does. They come off holiday here Friday. We'll see if they jump into this market at all. But, you know, we talk about supply, demand, and it feels like the market, at least on the soybean side with the explosion higher in the veg oils, soybeans, you know, we kind of digested that very bearish report. I know you and I talked a little bit via email after that report, the supply and demand numbers, uh, and I'm going to pull those up, or well, I should say the quarterly grain stocks, and we kind of mm -hmm. talked about how, you know, just that how surprising that number was and yeah. really interesting. And now we look ahead, we got the October supply and demand numbers coming up ahead of us. So a, a lot of things in front of us here with this soybean market to kind of unpack right now, Mike. Yeah, and I think you hit it on the nose with your opening commentary that we've traded a lot of that. You know, we took that bean corn ratio down to multi month, if not a couple year lows uh, when it comes to, or, or pl one plus year lows when it comes to the new crop beans against the corn. And so a lot of that, I think, has been already dialed in. And I think you're 100% right about that. I think the trade's probably opening itself up into a pretty wide trading range because we've got the IMF coming out with brand new economic data this week. We've got the Department of Energy coming out with brand new global energy demand. That's going to be a huge report because of what's happening in natural gas and what's happening in the fuel markets. And then we've got the USDA reports. We've got the, the debt ceiling issues that are starting to climb, kind of climb up our back now because it's not going away. I think we're going to open ourselves up into a very volatile, um, wider than normal trading range, um, mediocre volume, but it's going to give us a lot of nervousness, but probably just more or less spin our wheels until we get to that Tuesday WASDE report. I know you sent me a uh, chart. I'm going to pull this up here. You can kind of walk us through this. Some of the numbers you're seeing here, just looking at uh, the supply and demand side of the equation. Walk us through just what you've seen here the last couple of days and what you're seeing as we head into the October report. Yeah, this is a neat table because it kind of just breaks down simply as much as you can where the USDA is at and then where I am at. And then you can kind of go from there and look at the prices on the board and try and you know figure a few things out and what i mean by that is what we've been talking about what i did with this table this is my expectations i'm at a 548 carryover for wheat 1459 for corn and 293 for the soybeans notice those soybeans really stick out like a sore thumb and i'll go into more detail on that in a second but i've integrated into the beginning stocks the, uh, the corn and soybeans their grain stocks report, as you were talking about. I'm showing clients and subscribers where my uh, expectations are for um, the planted acreage number. In other words, I'm at 92.8 on corn. USDA is at 93.3. USDA for soybeans is at 87.2. I'm still up at 89. And so I go down through some of the key data, especially the exports and the total demand and the yield and planted acres and say, okay, where are we at compared to where USDA was in September and their WASDE report, and then factoring in that green stocks report. And what I what I would say to you, Jesse, is that my lower supply and lower demand on corn and beans um, compared to USDA put me pretty close to USDA when it comes to the corn ending stocks, but I'm way off probably what USDA would give us if we just factored in grain stocks report only, because that'd be about 266 for carryover instead of 293 using all the other USDA data for soybeans. Where does that bigger ending stocks number come from with me? Well, it really comes in from the uh, the, the, the planted acreage is kind of offset by um, the lower yield. So it's really not that. It really goes back to um, part of that is the, uh, is the yield, but a lot of that goes back to the imports as well. So about 89 million bushels of total supply and 10 million bushels of increased imports that I see coming into this country would suggest that I'm about 100 million bushels different um, from what maybe USDA would be at at this stage of the game, uh, plus or minus whatever that, that, that grain stocks report is. And so 
what I try and do with this is I say, okay, at, at 530 Dece corn, the trade's probably trading about a 135 carryover. So we're probably about 100 million bushels off if I'm right on the ending stocks number. Uh, at 1245 beans, the trade's probably trading about a 220 carryover and I'm at 293. USDA may be at 266 if they don't change anything else on the uh, beginning stocks figure. So what I'm getting at here is I think the beans are still the leader to the downside given the supply demand number. Well, great uh, analysis there, Mike. Uh, great stuff to to show us and, and talk about. For me, this corn market, I, I think this is one of the sleeper conversations to have moving forward just with the with the jump in fertilizer prices and, and energies. You know, we've we've been hearing about that. And the fact that this corn market really with with all the bearish factors we've seen come out, it's really hung around that 550, 540 mark here for quite a while. I think last month was the first month we didn't technically trade 550. I think we just barely missed it. But, I mean, you look at this market, it really is held together well. And to me, it bodes the argument that there could be quite a bit of upside potential in corn moving forward. Yeah, I mean, this is where it goes back to if I had to mark off the major issues that would prevent corn from going higher, we don't have to worry about as much the wheat market. Um, we don't have to worry as much about China not buying because it seems like they're still tight on corn and we have less competition around the world for the corn. We've talked about that for months and months. So really what it boils down to for me, Jesse, is, is my yield number of 175 nationally better than what USDA gave us. I still think it is based upon what clients are telling me. More importantly, if you really want to talk about upside in the corn versus downside in the corn, it really goes back to that ethanol policy. And, and we really saw the ethanol come around, as I said this week. We didn't get any kind of follow through selling after that new ethanol news came out about a week, week and a half ago. I found that very important. And I think that brought the bottom up in the price. So for me, simply put, to your point, my average price that I just showed you on the corn was is factoring in the downside in corn at about the March 31st high of around 480 for December futures. So I think that's the really low end of the market in this harvest time period for, for the corn. That's 50 cents. That's a lot. Don't get me wrong. But by the same token in the soybeans, my low number right now going forward here through harvest is all the way at the March 31st low, which is all the way down at 11.85. So you're talking about a substantial break if we go all the way back down there. And what we talked about a couple months ago after the last WASDE report or a couple WASDE reports ago, you know, back 2019, 2020, we had a 175 carryover, 185 carryover, and our average price was 1090 for soybeans. So every way I slice it, except for the ethanol policy, it seems like the corn has more support in. And that's simply put why I'm saying to clients, it's not worth, I just talked to a client in Champaign County, Illinois. He's running 87 bushel beans right now and he can get over $12 still. And so you're talking about $1,025 an acre on a low cost of production bean uh, year like we had this past year. And it, it makes no sense at all to me to go ahead and store that on farm or commercially Make as much room as you can if you have to for corn and let the beans go. And I, in my experience, I've had better luck at buying back uh, beans on paper than storing it in the bin, especially in the an environment where Brazil looks like it's getting wetter and it looks like they're going to be planted uh, in, in more of a timely fashion and have a better start to this year's crop than last year. Great thoughts there. Two other quick notes in my head, just thinking before we move to livestock, I know spring wheat's a fairly thinly traded market, but new contract highs in December today. And then also cotton. We don't talk about cotton a lot, but uh, you know they're talking about cotton in New York now on the stock market. And, and I, that cotton market's been surging here as of late as well. So I think that's a couple other key things to, to maybe watch out there as well. Just a couple of positive notes out there maybe for cotton growers and for spring wheat guys, if there's anybody who has a spring wheat crop still sitting in a bin somewhere. So. I think that's a great, that's a wonderful point. And I would add to that the oats market, we hit $6 in oats today. And so that oat market cannot help but be seen in the corn pits. And I know we don't have corn pits anymore, but I'm an old timer. But I think the trade sees $6 oats and says, 
what's corn doing at 535 if oats are at six bucks what don't i know at this point about what's going on and i thank goodness for the cotton market i'm so glad you brought that up because that's really attracting some acres where we really need to pull away from soybean acres and i just hope it lasts long enough for these producers to get their new crop booked and get it in the ground and that way not have to worry about those acres being turned back over into soybeans next year let's move to livestock and this week we've kind of seen this divergence between the cattle and the hog market hogs have started to take a beating maybe looking to fill some price gaps uh, some chart gaps out there possibly uh, meantime, cattle been trying to find some strength, been waiting on cash confirmation, but today was much of the same we've seen all week. Moderate gains in cattle, moderate losses in hogs. So uh, pick which where wherever you want to start, whether it's hogs or cattle, but what are you seeing in livestock this week, Mike? Well, I think what you said about the pork and bean trade is really appropriate that we saw the, the hogs break with the beans. They just can't seem to go together or go opposite one another and decouple for too long. So I think the hogs, I think the hogs, Jesse, are in good shape because the, the bellies have rallied back to $200 this week. We've got a cutout price now that's supporting the cash index at the Merck that's four to five dollars higher than October hogs. So I think the downside, it may still come, but I think it's going to be limited and on light volume. And so I would not participate in the idea of selling hogs here at these price levels, given that index. Now, having said that, the, the pork data and the beef data we got from USDA today at mid-session really kind of shows you, I think, the trend of 2022. And that is the beef sector is going to remain very, very stout on a tightening supply worldwide, while the pork sector is gonna to have to struggle with high competition, not just from beef, but from poultry. And what I mean by that was beef exports, January to August were up 21%. Pork exports for the same time were down two tenths of a percent. Uh, uh, broiler exports were up 5% January to August. And it's kind of similar there. Cattle imports, January to August were down 19%. But pork imports, actual physical meat of pork, uh, up 22%. So I think the, the hogs are going to remain more range bound. They're, they're probably going to have more of a chain on them unless something new happens in China as far as oversupply, then going to undersupply later in 2022. But to me, the cattle market is becoming more and more of a seller's market where, uh, where you can come in and as a producer, wait for your price. So I don't mean seller's market that you just keep selling it. I mean, hold out for your price as a seller, as a rancher. And I've been talking to clients this week, uh, cattlemen this week saying four to five dollars higher in these cattle would not surprise me if feeder cattle would go up another leg after that WASD report, if the corn would go lower. So I, I'm holding out for at least two, two and a half dollars higher on fat cattle prices right now. And I think five dollars may be in the, in the works. Well, Mike, as we look ahead, you mentioned that WASDE report. We got that next week. Um, any final thoughts, anything you have about that or anything you want to reiterate in general here on the show today? You know, just what we've been talking about, Jesse, with the currencies and the dollar, that, that really has done a really good job for us as far as uh, kind of anticipating and looking around the corner. I noted today that the uh, Brazilian real uh, got up to or got down to its lowest price in six months against the U.S. dollar. That that just can't be going on uh, as we go into November and December if if Brazil is planting. And remember 2020 and the reason why China bought it was because they needed it. They had their own problems. Brazil was short and Trump was banging on them with the phase one trade deal. And so we had those things come together almost in, right with one another as we were coming out of that first wave of COVID. And I think it's really important to go back and remember that, that this may not be like 2020. So be really on point with those currencies and be really nervous about the soybeans not holding their technical support after that WASDE report comes out. And that's another thing we didn't even get into was the uh, China trade issues and whatnot. And I think that's just going to be an ongoing story we'll have to watch moving forward. And South America as well, I think that weather story is going to start to be more of a, a topic here as we get into the middle of October. So some things to, I think, for you and I to watch there as well. But of course, Mike, you have a lot of great research and analysis, can help folks out. And they could simply uh, go to your website and uh, get in touch with you there to uh, learn more, can't they? Yeah, we've got to leave something out for people to go and do some investigation and uh, pick up the phone, call 866-471-2588 or go to globalcomresearch.com, globalcom with two M's, research.com, sign up for a trial. 
and uh, it'll be a two week trial. And uh, I'll call you once after it's over with or as it's ending and find out whether you like it, when you, whether you want to sign up. Well, Mike, we appreciate the time and the analysis as always. Thanks so much, sir. We'll talk to you next week. Have a great week, Jesse. Thank you. Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Find him, globalcomresearch.com. That's going to do it for the Wednesday, October 6th edition of Market Talk. Find us at markettalkag.com. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.